suburb of the dead. Do you know what the problem is when it comes to ghosts in the city? Chains are the last season's look. All the cool ghosts move to Portland. I think our waitress is a ghost if she isn't hurry with those drinks. Scoff if you all will, but I'm making a point here. To have ghosts, first you need it and you need the dead, and nobody's ever dead in the city. You must not read the police blotter. I never said nobody dies here. What I said that is that nobody's dead. We get rid of all the dead right away, and we all know where they go. Oh god, I hate that town. It creeps me out too. And it should. But it's even worse than you think. There are probably some things none of you know about the dead. Living here, you wouldn't have many opportunities to learn. And that's where my story comes in. It was as if it was as it happened, a dark and stormy night. The dead man could hear the rain, even as he was trapped in a cold box under the ground, smoldered by the weight of the earth. He was tired, but he felt potency in his dead limbs and a sudden, unexplainable sense of urgency that allowed him to press the lid open and drag his aching bones up through the dirt and out into the fresh air and the black night and the world of the living again. The dead man left his grave and knew where he was, the city. No, not quite, he corrected himself. He was in the town ten miles south of the city. They buried nobodies in the city itself. A hundred years ago, the city passed a law against any new burial sites, and they even moved the ones they had, evicting the dead. And this town sprouted like a mushroom on the city's southern border to hold all those dear departed who no longer had a place in the city itself. It was a town of cemeteries and mortuaries, a town of coffin makers and embalmers, a town of mausoleums and headstones, where the city's dead migrated for their eternal rest. A town with a thousand occupied graves for every one occupied house. The north became the city of the living, the south became the city of the dead. For the most part, the two kept to their respective cities and existed in peace. But tonight, the city in the south was sending an emissary, the dead man. And his mission was to increase the population of the dead city by one. There was someone in the living city who did not deserve to be there. The dead man sensed his target and knew instinctively who it was, his killer. The dead man remembered everything about his killer. His voice, his face, even the way his killer smelled. Death could not rob him of this knowledge. He would find him. Tentatively, tentatively the dead man tried to walk. His legs were stiff and tired after so many years in the grave. The cold rain felt good on his face. One step at a time, the dead man learned to walk again. And when he was ready, he walked down the hill, away from his headstone, through the little cemetery gate, and out onto the highway. He asked this road he remembered. He could follow it north the whole way. The dark night and the rain would hide the dead man's face from what few drivers and pedestrians there were. As he tried, he, made, he tried to make sense of things. As he walked, he tried to make sense of things. He remembered dying in a far-off city in another state. His parents must have his bo- must have it, had his body shipped back and buried here, close to home, close to the city he grew up in. Where were his parents alive now? Should he look for them? No, he decided. Best that they not seem like this. Best that they never know. The dead man understood with the same ingrained, reasonless certainty that directed him northward, that his killer was both alive and nearby. That was enough to worry about for now. He would have his business with no other living person. The dead man left his own cemetery behind, but others died at the roadside. If he strained his ears, he could hear them, the other dead men and dead women, down in their graves. Most of them snored in eternal slumber, occasionally shifting in a more comfortable position in their coffins. Some of the restless ones muttered to themselves, or even had some other conversations with those buried nearest them. A few talked about coming up like he had, but no one else seemed ready to do it tonight. He expected it. They often talked about such things without actually doing them. The dead man did wonder, though, 
whether he shouldn't pause for a conversation with a few. Why, right over there, Joe DiMaggio was buried. Imagine the talk they two would have. And there, over there, was Wyatt Earp's grave. And over there was Turk Murphy and Vince Garaldi. Doc Baker had been buried out here somewhere, too, after he died trying to escape from Alcatraz. Lily Coit, Charles D. Young, and even Emperor Norton himself. They were all here, and surely they wouldn't mind trading a few words with a dead man. Surely they were just as lonely as he was. But he had no time. Revenge was too precious, and had already been long to coming already. So the dead man slugged on through the rain, past the graves, towards the city lights, reflecting off those great shining glass towers like lighthouses for the fates. The dead man had always loved those great buildings. They made him feel young again. Something appeared then, a long, snaky, blazing apparition screaming its banshee wail into the night as it flew through the air. The damn man fell, panicked, terrified, scrambling for a hiding place, while the impossible thing slowed and then seemed to hover overhead. He clung to a concrete column, praying it did not see him. He tried to hold his breath, only to realize it now was not only impossible, but unnecessary. There was a snapping sound, and a ball rang. And then, strangely, the sound of feet tromping overhead like a column of soldiers marching on thin air. He dared look up and then realize what that glowing specter really was. An elevated train. The column he hugged supported the tracks. Late night commuters filed onto the platform at 20 feet overhead. And when the door slid shut again, the entire sh shrieking assemblage sh steamed off into the night. The dead man felt foolish, clearly things had changed in the years since he died. Once his embarrassment wore off, he realized the rail line was a boom for him. It would lean into the city, lead into the city, and if he followed underneath, he would encounter fewer late-night pedestrians than on the main highway. Staying close to the lights on the tracks, he followed them into the heart of civilization and closer to his prey. The pouring rain made rivers and streams of everything. He was glad that it seemed to be relieving him of the grave smell. The city by night was a strange thing, dark and vacant, but teeming with artificial animation, with the glare of electronic lights and the low whine of tires on asphalt. He did not belong here. The people of the dead city kept their place. It was the unspoken law of the dead, but tonight the rules bent. The dead man scampered beneath overpasses, through valleys, alleys, long ditches, and across vacant lots. Those few people who saw him took him from another homeless vagrant in a shapeless, foul-smelling clothes. The heavy rain hid face from them. He was tracking using senses he did not realize he had. Perhaps it was the spirit of a revenge himself that guided him. He came to one block, one street one house. It was one of the tall Victorian houses that they had called the Painted Ladies. Yes, this was the sort of house his killer would live in. His killer was a rich and powerful man, so powerful that he never he was never punished, even though everyone knew he killed the dead man. The dead, dead man crept to a window, streaked with rain, and squinted in the soft yellow lamplight inside. The living rooms filled with boxes, and the floor lined with newspapers that suggested painting project. Of course, the dead man thought, that explains why I've come back tonight. My killer has not only just come to live here in the city. The dead man smeared the glass with his blackened fingers, rage welling up in the hollow of his chest where his heart once sat. There was movement in another room. He clambered over a fence into a side yard, creeping up to a bedroom window. Yes. There he was. The dead man felt poisonous joy at the sight of his enemy. The killer wore a faded blue bathrobe as he picked through the rooms of his new house, filling the stacks of boxes with his hands. But how old he was! He had become gray and bent in the years since the dead man last saw him. And what was this? The killer's hands moved over everything with such delicate care, and a faithful dog trotted at his, time, at his side at all times. He's blind, the dead man realized, and all but helpless. But why the lamps? Then the dead man spotted the tire tracks in the wet driveway. Someone else lived here, too. A caretaker or a wife? 
Whoever it was, they surely wouldn't leave the old man alone for long. A dead man wanted to break through the glass and see the old man to break his bones and twist his limbs. His body was tired and clumsy, but strong, terrifyingly strong. But no, he had a better idea. He could get the old man to open the door for him. Yes, open the door and invite him in. Never realized that he was bringing doom into his home. The dead man went to the front door as loudly as he could. The door opened just a crack in a voice. This killer's voice, old and frail, but the same voice that the dead man knew so well. He said, Who's there? For a moment, the, the dead man wasn't sure he was capable of speech, but when he opened his mouth, the words came, though they sound garbled and strange. Sir, the dead man said in his voice like bird leaves, I'm a poor man with nothing in the world, and the rain has wet me to the bone. If you don't mind, I'd like permission to rest here a while on your porch and hopefully dry out a bit. That's the slim yellow line that indicated the door opening wavered for a second as if the house itself were pondering. Then the door opened and the old man, the killer, beckoned him in. Can't have you freezing out there. Come in and dry yourself off properly. The house was warm. The dead man felt the change in temperature vaguely, as if it were happening to someone else, and he was only observing it. You must excuse me, said the killer. I have not moved in yet. The first night in a new house is always the loneliest, said the dead man, following this killer deeper inside. The old man walked up with two canes, one to hold himself and the other to find his way. Even the dead man walked faster than his killer did. That's very true, his killer said. But when you get to be my age, any night can be a lonely one. I find I'm loneliest of all when someone is with me. It's the same with me, the dead man said. He dripped water on the hardwood floor, water black and green with the residue of his body. The rain, he knew, would cover the smell of his, sm of his smoldered flesh, even to the blind man's sensitive nose, but not for very long. That was all right. It would not need long. The old man's dog crouched near the door, tail between his legs. It looked at the dead man with head with its head cocked to one side. The dead man put a finger to his lips as a signal. Shh. The dog ran away. The killer grunted. He'd reached a chair and was doing his best to sit in it. He told the dead man his name. And who are you? His killer said. The dead man told him. The killer was quiet for a moment, and he said, I'm sorry, I, I don't think I heard you right. What's your name? The dead man said it again. The killer dropped his cane. Somewhere, the dog was crying. The old man began to shake. When he opened his mouth, no words came out. The dead man stood over his killer's chair, dripping with rain. It was a long time before the old man spoke. When he did, the only words he said were, I I'm, I'm sorry. You murdered me. The dead man said, No, said the killer. But the dead man, man's anger boiled over. He screamed, Don't lie! You murdered me, you bastard! You don't understand, said the killer. He was crying, feeble old man tears. No, I don't, the dead man said, because I've never killed anyone, but I'll understand soon. But I had to do it, said the killer. Don't you see? It had to be done. The dead man touched his killer's cheek gently. Answer a question, said the dead man, and I, might, and I may let you live. The killer's old blind eyes looked up at him. How many? The dead man, said the dead man. How many what? The dead, man's, the dead man wrapped his fingers around the killer's throat. How many people did you kill? Outside the rain was loud, like a thousand wet, clammy hands beating on the walls and windows. Do you even know how many people there were? Tell me that our lives meant at least that much to you, and I may let you go. The killer blinked. He furled his brow. He stammered. I. I. Then he started to stop. Slowly, very slowly, the dead man reached for the lamp. He turned out the light. In the dark, there was a sound like the last bit of water swirling down the drain. In another room, the dog began to hollow, howl, and then he began to cry. 
and then everyone, everything went quiet. They read about it, as the saying goes in tomorrow's newspaper. A blind retiree was murdered in his home late Saturday night, stunning this quiet residential neighborhood, and the police say his assailant is still at large. His wife had just gone to the store. They just moved in. There was no food in the house, a police spokesperson told the reporters. She came back to find the door open and her husband dead. The police identified the victim as Martin... Coughlin, 79, a former assistant district attorney from Reno. Coughlin had been both strangled and bludgeoned. Police said there was no signs of a break-in and appears that Coughlin opened the door to his, for his attacker. Coughlin was blind, blind due to complications from a surgery to remove a brain tumor two years ago. During his career at a Washu County prosecutor, Coughlin tried over 700 homicides. He achieved national notoriety after petitioning for the death penalty in the case of Dante Riggs. Riggs was accused of abducting and murdering a seven-year-old girl while on a gambling trip. He was executed in 1995, but the, the conviction was overturned posthumously when a new evidence was discovered. The public outcry against Coughlin's handling of the prosecution prompted his retirement. We came here for a fresh start, said Mar Martha Coughlin, 70, who made a brief statement to the press. It's really hard to know what to think. I guess I'd hope that not in this place, maybe after all these years, we could finally be freed of the ghosts from the past. But now it looks like the ghosts are all I have left. And that's why we're the only city in the world that banishes our dead. Wait, why? I don't understand what that has to do with the story. Well, when the dead stay too close to the living, they always want to come back up and cause trouble. If you put a little distance between the living and the dead, it means that only really important business can get them back up again. Well, I don't think I understood it. He wasn't, even, he wasn't really even a ghost, was he? And if you're saying this story is true, then how do you know about it? Who told you? Who do you think? I work in one of those cemeteries. The dead get chatty sometimes. And they don't have many occasions to talk, you know? So when one comes along, they're hard to shut up. They'll tell you almost anything. That's bullshit. I don't expect you to believe me. But you'll underst understand someday. None of us can stay in the living city forever. Sooner or later, we'll all take that trip south, and then you'll see. Anyway, that's my story. Does anyone have another?